So our next goal is to go down here, which is where the remote lab should be. So let's continue going through the bloom. I should probably get some samples. Northern Bloom. From here, the bloom rolls out over a vast plain, scraped clean of sand by vicious currents. This is as far north as we will go. Silicate skeletons. These beautiful lifeless shapes, like a sculptor's abandoned works, gather around the way station, rocking gently in the current. Uh. Alright, that gives us tons of oxygen. I remember right this creates a safe zone it do, we don't need it to be around those creatures I remember we had another I think less effective form of a safe zone that only seemed to work where creatures were hiding scorched plain the nearby bubble sits alone in this flat plain scorched by the chemical processes processes of billions of metabolizing cells Metal traces. The ghost of some equipment lies in the silt, one of many pieces lost in Manet's expeditions into the bloom. Bivalve creature. When active, these creatures feed directly on the microbial growth of the bloom, rapidly clearing a, pack, a patch of oxygenated water. Oh, it's just when the creatures are active, so it doesn't matter what I use? I guess I could probably just go near it and be fine, right? A large bulbous rock emerges out of the rock floor. Silt gathers in the winding cracks that score its surface. Mm, nope. This is not scared by my existence. What if I shrill sack it? No, okay, okay. Uh, I think we better move. Toxic waters, the rock outcrops of this area are clogged with strings of microbial growth which dance in the slight current. Rock sheets, huge plates of layered rock make the floor here into a jagged, jagged pattern of small overhangs. Toxic waters, blue flashes flicker across the shattered strata of rock. Protection. Ah. Ah, fan dust. That's the stuff that I think activated the creatures. Ah. Logged them. I'm naming these Bloom Fans. When we finally get out of this place, I'll update the base's taxonomy logs. Pale, delicate fans that feed on the bloom by filtering it through their bodies, using a catalytic dust to counter its toxicity. Uh, 
I'm going to continue to go south as much as possible until we, I assume we're going to get the ability to move around in these toxic waters without it being so toxic to us. So let's just try to get to the research lab first. Toxic waters. A sickly pale green light filters down onto the rocks. Rocks jut out from the green at strange angles. Blackened rocks. The rocks... The rock here is mottled with dark patches as if burned by electrical currents. Toxic waters. To the south of the central ridge of the bloom... To the south, the central ridge of the bloom reaches up, disappearing into green clouds of growth. <gasps> Safe zone! This is probably the research base, then? Maybe? Nesting creatures. When their protective bubbles begin to fail, these creatures burst from their nest to repair them, swarming out to weave more threads. Silicate skeletons. Strange glittering domes marked with ornate patterns of holes sit in the silt. Whatever inhabited them is long dead. Crystal cylinders. Protected by the sheer wall of the bloom's central ridges, these open nests flutter with the movement of their swarms. Central ridge. Splitting the bloom, this vast ridge descends to the north, where it may be possible to cross. So... I can't... continue here? Okay, I guess I'll go east. Northeast? <laughs> Through the green clouds, something bright glows in the dark ahead. Is that a good thing? Like our goal, perhaps? The microbial life of the bloom blankets every surface. What other life can survive in this toxic landscape? The burning clouds of the bloom roll across the rocks. You know, before we continue, I want to get some more oxygen. Ah, safety again. Uh. I guess I'll keep going east? I don't really know. Rock outcrop, like stone... Tumors, these rounded rocks rise up out of the green toxic clouds. Let me just make sure I remember right that this fan dust isn't going to do anything magical here. No, it lasted for like half a second. And now this is somewhere we've already been. Yeah, this is back around when we first came into this place, isn't it?
Hmm. Metal traces, the faint signature of a metal alloy, perhaps the remains of equipment Manet brought into the bloom. What was she doing here? Filtering fan. Actually, why, why am I reading that? Let's get out of this. Uh, I don't think we need more fan dust. We have a lot. What is that? Ah! The bivalve. These strange little creatures are getting a big name. Bivalve bloom veins. What do you think? Bivalve bloom veins. Cool. I like it too. We can log them into the taxonomy back at the base. A fan-finned creature which conceals itself within a shell as a form of protection, and when awoken, feeds on the bloom's toxic microbes. Alright, so that's where we can make a safe zone with the fan dust. Activates a creature, and the creature does its thing. And there's a safe zone. I'm curious if this goes anywhere, though. Nothing but sharp, sharp rocks and green waters. Yeah, not really. Silt piles. In the rustled holes of the rock shelf, silt has gathered, forming a rare shelter for life in the bloom. Corroded shelf. Layers of rock stick out from beneath the silt, eaten away by the microbes of the bloom. I don't... Should I go east? Not, like, not really, I don't think so. Melt hole. I don't think I really have time to read that stuff, unfortunately. Not right now. Are these... Yeah, it's the bivalves. Oh, this is something new. Bivalve shell. Silt drift. Piles of silt have gathered up against these melted rocks, filling in the gaps beneath their strange distorted overhangs. Okay. I don't know if I should keep pushing. Or just go back and refill my oxygen. We do have another one of these. I guess I'll use it. Toxic waters. Shards of rock with green clouds between turn the seafloor into a miniature landscape. Yeah, that just hooks up with everything else. Did not go where I expected it to go. Let's get refilled. Ah. <sighs> and let's do a little bit of science. Take a break from the stressful work.
So we have a new sample and we also have a couple old samples that we couldn't examine because we didn't have the entries in the taxonomy for them to be applied to. So I think they'll work now, at least some of them. Yeah, not that one. But this one should... Yes. Bivalve, bloom vein. So we got observation and theory. Bloom veins conceal themselves in bronze-colored shells most of the time, only coming out when the opportunity to feed presents itself. Highly attuned to the currents and flows of the bloom, bivalve bloom veins take advantage of any break in the bloom's flow to unfold from their shells and feed. They feed primarily on the bloom's microbial growth itself, able to quickly establish and maintain a feeding zone of oxygenated water. When the bloom vein tires, it will then retreat back into its shell, burying itself in the silt once more. I would like to understand more about how the bloom veins are able to feed directly on the microbes of the bloom, considering the extremely high toxicity. Perhaps something we uncover here could be useful for future expeditions into the unforgiving landscape of the bloom. Theories. After being lucky enough to come across an entire bloom vein shell, analysis has provided some possible explanation for the creature's neurotoxin resistance. The shell itself was found to have radial patterns of tiny holes in certain areas, all of which were found to have a high concentration of the bloom neurotoxin. It seems that when the bloom vein is in its hidden resting state, it exudes the neurotoxin through its shell, processing the glucose in the bloom growths separately. This exuded neurotoxin coats the bloom vein's shell and the surrounding area, making the creature potentially deadly to any predator. This adaptation to the bloom is therefore a highly effective defense mechanism, even if the bloom vein itself is constantly on the edge of a frenzied neurotoxin-induced death. Observation and behavior for the bloom fan. Bloom fans are delicate and pale fan-shaped creatures that filter the toxic microbes of the bloom. As tall as a human and with a wide span of pale spines that form a feather-like shape, they're instantly recognizable in the green, clouded water of the bloom. Anchoring themselves into the sand with a central stem, the bloom fan's filtration leads to a small patch of oxygenated water on the leeward side of the fan. Bloom fans seem to have to be sensitive to currents, adjusting their angle for better catchment of microbial growth, and also can often be seen shivering in order to free their delicate filaments of bloom growths. How they contend with the high toxicity and deoxygenated waters of the bloom is unclear, but perhaps analysis of the dust that coats their spines may offer some clues. Behavior A close analysis of the fan dust shows that the fans catalyze the bloom's microbes into massively increasing their oxygen production to the point that the cells themselves are torn apart by the oxygen that bubbles out from within them. This is why bloom fans can be heard to be fizzing when in close proximity, and suggests that oxygen is a primary nutrient that the fans acquire from filtering. Interestingly, this analysis suggests that the, the bloom's microbes are oxygen-producing by nature, and may be a form of algae. It is only their sheer density blocking their access to sunlight, which means they no longer produce oxygen, but instead choke and poison the ocean. Meanwhile, it seems unlikely that the fans live on oxygen alone. What other nutrient sources might bloom fans use to support themselves? So if we look at the map again, hmm. So we got a couple samples. Bloom froth and bloom fan stem. It is just like straight up south. What happened though? I think maybe what happened is we hit. I think we hit this part. Like, I think we went down here and kind of around here, and then we hit this big ridge, and then we had to keep just going along this ridge. So we need to go 
Yeah, we need to go west. Try to go west as much as possible to try to go through here. Then we should be able to make our way down. Let's try to speed it up. Oh, I never went there. Bubble Edge. Uh, yeah, let's not read it. I gotta go fast. Yeah, this is the way to go. There's a creature there, but since I'm just on the move, I don't think I want to have it, makes it make an oxygenated area. sure which way I should go. I guess try to stay west as much as possible. Ooh, I see safety. <sighs> Spear fragment will be good for giving me oxygen. In fact, let's use it right now. Silicate skeletons. Open geometric forms. Beautiful and strange. Sit huddled within the skin of the bubble. Crystal cylinders. At the center of the bubble, rounded shapes sit in a bed of silt. Around them, the water dances with streaks of refracted light. New species! I'll call these weavers. For those beautiful nests and bubbles they weave. What would we do without them? White sand. A million tiny grains, perhaps the broken down remains of those silicate skeletons, gather here in soft, sparkling waves. You know what? We just got... A new sample here, right? Or did we? Actually, we didn't. We logged a new species. We didn't get a new type of sample. Because I remember from the map that wherever we find a sample more towards the west, there should be another sample just a little bit to the east. But I guess that's not relevant. Because we haven't found either. Bubble skin. Though physical objects seem to be able to pass, the fizzing skin of the bubble completely obstructs the bloom's microbial clouds. Oh, I kind of want to go this way. Nah, don't be silly. Just... Just get to the lab and then hopefully we can move through this stuff easier afterwards. Is that new? 
These olive green clumps of bubbles seem to gather where there is little current and the growth of the bloom settles. These microbial growths seem big enough to log and sample. Let's see what they can tell us about this place. Yes. Let's go. Gonna get samples real quick. Can't read that, unfortunately. Hold on. Uh. Oh, that's something new. Full. We got one of it, though. We gotta be near the research base. Research site is what it said. Get in there. <sighs> this place was pressurized at some point. It must have taken months of work to establish this lab. And just weeks of corrosion for it to fall into ruin. It looks like Manet was gathering those mineral skeletons, studying them. What secrets have you uncovered, Manet? How were these strange silicon spheres worth all this? Crystal cylinders. As we are now, Manet must have relied on the protective bubbles these spheres provide to study the bloom in its ecosystem. Bloom froth, new species logged. We won't get much from observing this stuff. I've logged the species. Let's analyze the samples back at base. Dark green bubbles that form in the most dense areas of the bloom where there's little current to provide water flow. Just nest workers, so not something new. What are these again? Fan dust. That's not too important to have a bunch of that, so I'm going to release some of these. More of these ornate silicate globes sit in the silt. These bubbles must have been both their refuge and their grave. Sphere fragment would be good for oxygen. I should probably take that. I don't need this many of these. Well, actually, let's get rid of a fan dust. Dissected skeletons. The equipment here suggests Manet was studying the mineral skeletons. Where she's cut through, the silica shines pure silver. Bubble Edge. Beyond the bubble, the angular shape of the lab's second module sits silent, wrapped with cords of microbial growth. Wait, beyond the bubble? The lab's second module? Oh, so this isn't all. Where's the second module? I'm not sure. There's this over there? Yeah, I'm not sure. So we can go down. But is there anything here? No? Okay, let's go down. Melted module. These modules are so rapidly melting away. Are the bloom's microbes metabolizing the metal itself? Let's make a protective zone. Oh. 
Oh. So we're gonna dive. Dark opening. The hold metal floor of the module reveals an opening to a passage below. Hope it's safe down here? Oh, looks like it is. Steel passage. Manea must have laid this under the lab when she constructed it. The water's clearer here, shielded from the microbial clouds. Hidden workshop. Machines glint in the dark. Papers and tools lie still on silt-speckled surfaces. It's as if the scene has been frozen, captured in time. This is not just a lab, it's a workshop. She was building something down here. It's a... It's a suit. It looks like she was modifying an old atmospheric heart suit. How deep was she planning to go? These are verified for beyond a thousand meters. I'm going to see what I can pull from the notes and documents here. Some of them are still partially readable. The lack of water flow must have kept them in good condition. She was definitely specking this suit for use beyond the drop-off, modifying it with the silicate skeletons. Artificers, she calls them. Exoskeletons of nanofibrous goethite, protecting a silicon carbide core. The pressure resistance of their exoskeleton is unprecedented for a biological material. That would take the depth rating of the hard suit well past 3,000 meters. Incredible. But why go over the drop-off at all? What was pushing her forward? She was incredibly driven. Desperate, even. She mentions sending ROVs down to the abyssal plain, cobbled together from bits of the base. All of them were lost. And her work on the suit failed. That's where the notes seem to end. The most recent document mentions another way. Did she make it? How? This suit was so close to completion, why abandon it? We have to make that dive. If I can fix up this suit, we can take it over the drop-off. Perhaps Manet managed it. We need to follow. I can do this. We can do this. Let's get back outside and call in the drone. Glad to see you're back online. Sorry for the rush, but we've got to move. I've been going through Manet's notes from her lab, and from what I can tell, she attempted a... Well, a... Free dive. Over the drop-off. That's why she left her suit behind. She must have opened it up and... Descended. I know what you're thinking. There's no way she could freedive thousands of meters to the ocean floor. But that's what she did. Willingly. And we're going after her. We need to dive now. I've been working on the suit, and it's almost ready. I've used sections of Manet's failed hard suit to modify our suit. Now it's a full atmospheric dive suit. Internally, we should be able to maintain one atmosphere of pressure for me and that casing of yours. It'll work just like before, but our depth rating is massively increased. We can hit two, maybe three thousand meters. The suit's in the bay, so 
Load whatever samples you need. I've marked the drop-off on the map. We can dive there directly and search for any... evidence there. I have no idea why she would do this. It's... suicide. But she seemed to believe she could do it. Get ready to go. I'll be waiting. Well, I think this is a pretty good place to end the episode, so I hope you've enjoyed so far, and when I return, we might make the dive. Ellery made it sound really urgent, but also I kind of want to go get the other samples. I don't know. Where is the drop-off? Ah. Up there. So we just go north from the central reef, it looks like? I don't think just... going over here... And doing the drop-off would equal the end of the game? Like, I doubt it. It feels like there's a lot more taxonomy entries that have yet to be filled in. So, I think I can probably safely go to the drop-off and not be leaving the other samples behind permanently. Yeah, so next episode we are doing the drop-off. <laughs>